Okay, in this segment, we're going to take a look at Europe and, its, and how it reaches the Western Hemisphere. And so um, let's appreciate uh, certain dimensions to this because when we uh, understand something about our existence today, um, Europe is integrated uh, in every aspect of our existence. So uh, let's understand something about migration. Migration is very important. The importance of migration is, is key to recognizing uh, the creation of us as, as Mexicans, um, as uh, native populations uh, in, endure and experience something about Europe coming to the Western Hemisphere. In fact, most of you can understand the importance of migration today because we are entering an age of mass displacement. Um, the, the, there's a worldwide redistribution of, of people that is occurring today um, as a result of war, as a result of warfare. Um, estimates reach that 68 million people are currently exiled from their homes by violence. Uh, the World Bank, by 20, uh, a recent study by the World Bank reveals that by 2050, at least 140 million people are going to be forced to relocate be because of the effects of climate change. Uh, and then, of course, there is the inequality that is occurring throughout the world. Um, it continues to drive poor people to wealthier nations. So we see a migration, world migration of populations uh, of people uh, from areas of violence moving over to Europe, uh, of here in South America, Central America, of them moving to the United States. And why is that? Because Europe and the United States have all the wealth. They're imperialist nations. And so when you have people who are in poverty, they're going to go to where the food is, where the wealth is. So let's understand and let's recognize the importance of migration. Migration. Uh, we know that in Native North America, migration was, was, was the key to survival. People have been in constant motion uh, throughout the North American continent, uh, especially in the area known as the Southwest United States and Northern Mexico. Uh, people have been going back and forth across what we call the present-day U.S.-Mexico border and all borders of nations in the Western Hemisphere since time immemorial. We know that. Let us understand that the region of the people reflect the diversity that is prevalent today. Uh, the present-day United States has been home to culturally diverse populations since time immemorial. The U.S. contains an environmental and a geographic diversity that is impressive and is awe-inspiring. Native peoples develop specific linguistic traditions reflecting their interaction with the environment. And since time immemorial, people have uniquely responded to the environmental and geographic diversity of what is commonly referred to by Native populations as our mother, the Earth. So when we take a look at migration and the beginning of a migration process, that's a decision by an individual or a family to migrate. You see, migration is a movement from one place to another. So we in the United States take migration largely for granted. But we must recognize that people are constantly migrating. It is a phenomenon that has been taking place since the original inhabitants of this land have existed and taught us how to appreciate the earth. People since time immemorial have been moving across this turtle's backs from deserts to plains, to, from rivers to coastlines, and for what? For economic survival. It's the search for economic survival. Now, we use many different words. There's emigration, means that you leave one country. There's immigration, that means you, you're, you're arriving in another country. Emigration, immigration, it all refers to the same thing, migration. There are collective terms. Individuals who leave one country are immigrants. When they enter a new country, they become immigrants. Now, why are the people in constant motion? It's because they're searching for opportunities to continue their economic existence. People are constantly searching for economic survival. Most often, people want to make sure that they can achieve a subsistence level that guarantees their families will be fed, clothed, and sheltered. 
And again, I'm re reintroducing you to that word subsistence. And in this way, we can appreciate that throughout human history, and it's occurring to this day, people are migrating throughout the world, people have migrated throughout the world in search of a decent human existence. So likewise, it's also important to understand that wherever there are economic systems that have been established, labor forces are required to create the infrastructure that facilitates the exchange of goods and services. Consequently, history reveals that systems are constantly looking to form and control labor forces so as to create markets as well as build a monumental architecture designed to enhance the exchange of goods and services. So throughout history, we witness the formation and control of labor forces in order to facilitate the enhancement of economic growth and development. So these two, if we can put them ring up, the search for economic survival, the formation and control of labor forces. These are key. If we can bring that uh, PowerPoint up uh, to the front, we can understand it. So whether it be organized through voluntary labor agreements or enslaved labor or contractual forms of labor, systems desire people's skills, systems desire people's knowledge, systems desire uh, 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 people's uh, assets, okay? So whether it be organized, uh, again, through voluntary labor agreements, whether it be through enslaved labor, contractual forms of labor, systems recruit workers. Right? Workers migrate to areas where their labor is valued, where their labor is required. So we want to appreciate that throughout the historical development of the United States, throughout the historical development of Mexico, throughout the historical development of the Western Hemisphere, there is a constant need to form and control labor forces. And so this need to control and form labor forces is tied to government policy and international relations. So when you take a look at today, businesses in the United States rely upon the federal government to find them workers. Since the colonial era, governments have been involved in securing voluntary immigrants or involuntary immigrants to this country. It's part of international policy. So the United States federal government has, has, has been actively recruiting labor forces for this country since its inception. Treaties and negotiations are entered into to bring labor forces into the United States for its economic development and growth. So labor recruitment is central to the migration of European populations to the Western Hemisphere. Labor recruitment is central to the migration of African populations to the Western Hemisphere. And labor recruitment is central to the migration of Asian populations to the Western Hemisphere in general and to the United States in specific, especially since the colonial period. So we have to appreciate a, 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 an understanding of how workers are going to be migrating to areas where their skills and knowledge are in demand, where the receiving country is going to create a process where these recruited workers can be recognized as contributing to the social order. So this means that each receiving country creates laws that allow the migrants a, a, a chance to become a part of civil society. So we need to appreciate something with regards to what's going to happen as Europe is going to come to the Western Hemisphere and bring labor forces to this country. So there's going to be many, many different definitions of work. There's skilled and unskilled categories. There's going to be many, def many, many definitions of what it means uh, to, to, to work, of, of what it means to be a, a servant, what it means to be a slave. Okay? So let's appreciate that prior to the establishment of the British colonies on the mainland of the eastern United States. Today, Spain is going to have over 100 years of establishing labor forces in areas that are part of the country today, uh, part, primarily Florida and New Mexico. I mean, slavery is a system under which people are going to be treated as property and are going to be forced to work. Okay? Slaves are going to be the involuntary immigrants. So prior to the uh, 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 arrival of Great Britain, we're going to take a look at the Spanish. The Spanish are going to be here over 100 years prior to England establishing labor forces. 
Likewise, prior to the creation of independence in the United States, um, there's going to be places like Texas, Arizona, and California that are going to be witnessing market expansions through the use of diverse ethnic populations as labor forces. But what is important to note about United States labor history is that it has a rich Mexican foundation rooted in Spanish colonial expansion. So, um, again, let's understand and appreciate certain things. Now, there is what is known as the colonial legacy. And the colonial legacy is important because outside of Spanish colonial infrastructure that is maintained for tourist purposes today, especially here in Los Angeles, is the legacy of, uh, of the era that is race-based privileges. All right? We're going to talk about these things, the race-based privileges and biases that are based on a class caste system, a system based on the color of one's skin. And this is the legacy. <coughs> it is still with us, and it affects everyone because we have all adopted the resulting prejudices and biases associated with skin color. So when we take a look at the ethnic and the class structure of society, what became the contemporary United States Southwest and Northern Mexico, it is a reflection, as we're going to learn in this class, and a continuation of a colonial legacy of race-based privileges. When we take a look at populations in motion, they are looking for economic opportunity. Now, let's recognize that all of the racial strains in the Mexican experience stem from migration and immigration. And most importantly, cultural diversity. Because cultural diversity characterizes the populations that are going to come into contact with each other once Columbus arrives. And once Columbus uh, uh, arrives, he's going to initiate what is known as the age of exploration through contact and conquest. And this is uh, Europeans. Europeans are going to be involved in search for markets, and search for wealth, and search for labor forces. And they're going to introduce a new kind of slavery, a slavery that will be racial, a slavery that will be perpetual, a slavery that will be hereditary. Ancient societies tolerated slavery, but Europeans in their quest to reach historical magnificence are going to form and control Native American labor forces and African labor forces and Asian labor forces by introducing racialized slavery through contact and conquest. Native Americans and Africans will be dehumanized and racialized through contact and conquest. So this, this is the racism of our modern sickness. Okay? This is the colonial legacy. This is the, the, the legacy. The legacy. Okay? So uh, this, is, this is the inheritance. Now, once Columbus initiated the encounter between what is referred to as the Old World and the New World, uh, European powers, specifically Spain, France, and England, and then the United States are going to negotiate agreements for the recruitment of labor forces and the expansion of markets. And in the process, international accords are going to be written specifically connecting the movement of populations to the expansion of markets. Spain, France, and England are actively going to recruit populations, again, for the expansion of colonial markets. So their foreign policies are going to incorporate legal instruments to contract and form labor forces. They searched for labor forces. They created labor contracting agencies throughout Europe, Africa, and Asia. And these labor forces are going to find their way to the Western Hemisphere. So when the United States was created, the Founding Fathers inherited the British colonial experience that shaped the way the Constitution approached labor formation, that shaped the way the Constitution approached immigration, that shaped the way the Constitution approached settlement policy. Immigration was tied to labor force recruitment and participation. So foreign policy has always been instrumental in securing workers for the expansion of markets. So when we address pre-revolutionary immigration, yeah, and let's understand certain things about pre-revolutionary immigration. Right? Prior to the creation of the United States, pre-revolutionary immigration, prior to the creation of the United States, immigration was so common that colonial governments, because it's going to be the British, the French, and the Spanish, 
that are going to vie for native territory in North America and in, uh, in the North American continent and in the Western Hemisphere, really, because those are the three major languages outside of Portuguese. And we're going to understand pre-revolutionary immigration. Immigration was so common in the colonial period that the, the British, the French, and the Spanish, they didn't regulate the flow of populations. We had, uh, again, we're experiencing today uh, this significant uh, 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 mass displacement of populations today that's a result of worldwide terror created by the United States as well as uh, uh, the climate change. We're just looking at 68 million people. Well, what's going to happen is the same kind of experience occurred a long time ago at the very beginning, at, at, at the initiation of, of contact, uh, when, when Europe does reach uh, and meet the Western Hemisphere. So when we take a look at <clears throat> pre-revolutionary immigration, the British, the French, and the Spanish did not regulate the flow of populations. Now, can you imagine if the Native American populations uh, had come together to create a common immigration policy? I mean, you know how hard it is just to create immigration reform policy here in the United States. Congress can't get its act together uh, for the last 30 to 40 years, can't get its act together with regards to forming uh, uh, an appropriate uh, immigration policy. Can you imagine uh, if the Native American peoples, if, if, if they had gotten together to create an immigration and labor policy? Can you imagine? Well, let's imagine. Let's go to a film clip and let's appreciate uh, something that would be most imaginative of an Indian immigration policy. white people they just keep flooding across our border oh sure come on in take our jobs eat our corn see what we care and you know the second they get here they just start having kids oh totally and you know what's worse they don't use every part of the buffalo that's it tonight after the rain dance we talk to the chief Okay, that should give us scattered showers tomorrow with a 75% chance of sun through the weekend. Chief, every day our borders are being crossed by uninvited foreigners. We have to do something. Well, if you ask me, and hey, this is just me talking here, I say we shoot them all in the head, make jackets out of their skin, and then leave their carcasses to rot in the sun. Uh, okay. Well, I say we welcome them. They're good for the economy, they gave us these comfy blankets, and come on, can anyone here honestly say they don't like fire water? Didn't they kill your entire family in a raid last week? Okay, I'll admit there are some cultural differences. Oh, you pale face loving hippie! Excuse me, but pale face seems like a racially charged term. Can we call them something less offensive? Like what, hugs with trees? Well, their boots make a cracking sound when they walk. Why don't we call them crackers? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. From now on, everybody calls white people crackers. All right, so how do we keep these damn crackers from coming here? We could build a giant fence to keep the crackers from sneaking onto our land. Oh, come on. You know those crackers would find some way to sneak in. We need enforcement. I say we lock their cracker asses up. Enough. Tomorrow I will issue my ruling directly to the crackers. As protector of the lands between Sacred Bear Mountain and Lake Popozao, I declare the following new laws. All uninvited crackers will now be considered illegal crackers, and we can send them back to where they came from at any time. <gasps> send us back to England? England? We thought you came from the moon. Oh. <laughs> Furthermore, illegal crackers are now required to register with our guest Indian program. And, after living in harmony with the land for at least six years, they will be given a junior scout card that must be presented at all training posts, wigwams, wampum shacks, casinos... Oh, 
Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, you can what? Yes, we can live here and work in this new land. Uh, it's our basic human right. Well, what about our right? And how dare you fly a foreign flag in our country? And how dare you? Uh, uh, what, what are you, like a Wookiee? I hate Krakens! <laughs> They have come to bring us wisdom. Shh, listen. Hey, everybody, just chill out, okay, man? Everybody freaking chill. Oh, chill. Oh, chill. Oh, chill. Yes. Yes. These people aren't immigrating. They're, like, migrating. Yeah, it's just like how we fight out for the winter because it's too freaking cold. These people just came here because England sucks. I mean, nobody would live in England if they had a choice, right? It's too freaking cold there. You know, the freaking country sucks. They freaking come here, you know? What's the big freaking deal? So if we welcome this new wave of immigrants, no harm will come to us? Probably not, man. Yeah, what's the worst that could happen? Oh, okay. <laughs> and so the Indians lived in harmony with the white man forever. And immigration was never a problem in America again. Okay, so maybe you're understanding the significance of this particular segment, what I'm trying to talk about with regards to immigration, to migration, to the movement of populations. And I, I chose this particular uh, um, film clip simply because it, it deals with every prejudice that we have with regards to Native peoples, uh, Europeans, uh, in fact, the whole... What, what, what the prejudices that people have towards immigrants, uh, the debate that's taken place, especially with regards to building walls. Uh, but this, this at least helps us appreciate something uh, that we're going to be dealing with in this class with regards to the formation and control of labor forces and policy. And uh, I wanted to address the significance in this segment uh, for you to appreciate uh, the, that for nearly two centuries, uh, in the colonial period, when Europe does uh, reach the Western Hemisphere, uh, Europe and all of its uh, attitudes towards uh, the populations, uh, the role of race uh, is going to be very important, especially since we're going to be dealing with the Spanish and the English, since those are the two languages that we're going to be uh, dealing with in this class. Uh, the role of race in Spain and England is very important to appreciate. So that's, that's the colonial heritage, the Caribbean era. What happens in the Caribbean is going to be very important that we're going to be exploring in the next segments. But in this segment, I wanted everyone to understand uh, the significance of migration, formation and labor, uh, control of labor forces, and race-based privileges, of which I will talk more about later in depth. But this was just an introduction to recognize how Europe is going to meet the, um, um, the Western Hemisphere. So when we look and understand uh, the immigration patterns that are going to occur as a result of Europe and Africa and Asia coming into the Western Hemisphere, because prior to the creation of any nation of the Western Hemisphere, immigration was so common that colonial governments are not going to regulate the flow of populations. So <clears throat> for nearly two to three centuries, we're going to see that immigrants are going to be desired. Um, adventurers are going to be recruited through legal and extra-legal means uh, to expand and influence first the Spanish. The Spanish will be in the Western Hemisphere for about 100 years, uh, well-established themselves, and then the French arrive, and then the British and the Portuguese down in South America. So the Spanish, French, Portuguese, and British interests in the Western Hemisphere, uh, their arrivals are, are going to be important. Um, the historical record will take a look at what it notes with regards to the arrival of the Spanish, and that's what our, our next segment will take. Um, so that concludes this particular segment of the introduction to Europe meeting the Western Hemisphere.